to dissect a brain, we better know what the parts of it are. So we're going to focus a little bit more on the structures that make up your central nervous system. We've talked about the basic unit of function. We've talked about how a neuron works, uh, how a neuron communicates information through nerve impulses, how neurons have synapses between them or between them and an infector. Now we need to talk about some of the larger structures that your nervous system has that, of course, neurons make up. Now, as a reminder, you have both gray and white matter in your nervous system. Specifically in your central nervous system, the gray matter is found on the peripheral, so the exterior regions of the brain, but the H, or sometimes I, it looks more like a butterfly than an H, the H shape inside the spinal cord. So it's sort of opposite. On the brain, the gray matter is on the outside. On the spinal cord, the gray matter is in the middle. The white matter then is the internal region of the brain. So if we're looking at a brain here, you see that kind of black line. It's showing that's the section that we're looking at. If we were to slice the brain right there and take a look at it, you would see a gray sort of section just in the very exterior region. It's not super thick. Uh, and then most of the middle is filled with white matter. There are also things called ventricles that contain your cerebrospinal fluid, but I'll mention that on an, another slide. Uh, the white matter then is the internal region of the brain, but the external region of the spinal cord, so the internal H or butterfly shape is gray, but the part that surrounds it, kind of the round part of the spinal cord, that is where white matter is. And your spinal cord itself, even though we've already mentioned it, uh, is a column of nerve tissue that extends from your brain and it descends into a canal in the spine. So from your brain all the way down to the end of your spine. It's the link between your brain and your peripheral nervous system. So remember PNS, peripheral nervous system. And like we already saw, it is your primary reflex center. This is where reflex go. Uh, your brain is involved in lots of other things, but the reflex itself travels through the spinal cord. And then like we saw with reflexes, your brain becomes involved and that's why you yell or have a perception of pain when you touch something hot. Now, one of the cool things that your central nervous system has yeah, is a bunch of built-in protection. If you have ever touched a brain, you probably haven't, I have, this brain right here is really firm feeling. Uh, so this model here, if you want, you could touch it. It comes apart, has all these parts, and it's very cool. Um, but it feels really firm. So it, it has the firmness of like a, a rubber ball or something. An actual brain, though, is the mushiest, squishiest thing uh, that you've ever seen. It is not firm at all. It is easy uh, to ruin. And so when I was doing research in the lab in university, one of the things that I had to do at the end of my study was remove the brain from the skull so that I could slice it up and put it on slides and look at it under a microscope. But the brain, when you take it out, is like pudding that's gotten a little firm. It is not tough feeling at all. And it makes, it made me wonder like, man, this is really easy to damage. It really is, and I damaged a few of them. Now to prevent that, we flash froze them. It was cool. I got to use liquid nitrogen, it was the most awesome thing ever. That's not really the point though. The brain is mushy, so it needs lots of things built in to protect it. Now, the picture that's here has a lot of detail that is beyond the scope of this course, but I like the way it showed all the layers, which is why I included it. So if we look from the outside, you've got some scalp, then you've got the periosteum and the bone of the skull. So you've got this big, thick, hard bit of bone there covered with skin and hair. Then you have these layers of tissue between the bone of your skull and the actual tissue of your brain. So if you look down here, you can see this dark line around the edge that represents the gray matter. But there's these layers of tissue between your skull and the actual tissue of your brain. And those layers uh, help protect your brain in addition to the mechanical protection that your skull gives. So one of the things those layers of tissues do is help form something called the blood-brain barrier. You might be surprised to know that blood is bad for your brain. If blood were to touch your brain tissue, it's quite cytotoxic and will cause brain tissue to die. So we do not want blood to mix with brain tissue. What your brain does want is the stuff that's in your bloodstream. 
So the brain has to use a lot of oxygen. About 20% of your body's total volume of oxygen is consumed by your brain. Um, so blood is needed to transport this oxygen to your brain. But we don't want everything else that's in your blood. We don't want those minerals and all that other stuff. We don't want the hemoglobin. We just want the oxygen and the glucose uh, that's coming through your bloodstream so that your brain can function. There are capillary walls, and so you might remember in Bio 20 talking about blood vessels, and capillaries were the smallest of the blood vessels. They had really thin walls so that substances could diffuse in and out of them easily. And so blood vessels uh, will get smaller and smaller until we get to the capillary, um, but only a few substances can actually pass out of your bloodstream, across the membrane, and into your brain tissue. Anything that is fat soluble can also cross. So I bring this up because I hope you see, I've named some drugs here. There are lots of drugs that easily cross the blood brain barrier because they're fat soluble. Caffeine is one, nicotine is one, heroin is one. Um, but any substance that can cross the blood brain barrier will have easy access to your brain tissue, which would explain some of the uh, rather immediate and uh, intense effects that you can get from those. The main tissues that make up this barrier are called the meninges. They are three layers of solid elastic tissue. So they're stretchy, but they're tough. Now, if you look at the picture, the skin was on the outside, then we got the bone. Then we have the next two layers that are called the dura mater. That's the first of the meninges. You don't have to know the names of the meninges. I'm just telling you that they're there. Then you have this layer called the arachnoid. It kind of looks spider webby, which makes sense that that's the name that we gave to it. So if you look, you can see kind of this sort of filmy looking thing that has the, the look of spider web silk. That's the arachnoid. And then right next to your brain tissue, you have the pia. Those three layers make up the meninges. And if you look, blood vessels run in between them. So the meninges kind of contain the blood vessels. They keep them separate from your skull and separate from your brain tissue. Now you have some other mechanisms for protection in your central nervous system. You have cerebrospinal fluid. So I mentioned on the last slide there was something called a ventricle and you can see kind of a blue space there. There are lots of spaces or cavities in your central nervous system that contain this cerebrospinal fluid. It has a function similar to that of blood plasma. Uh, blood plasma, if you recall from Bio 20, is made mostly out of water and helps dissolve things and transport things. So that's where you would find dissolved substances, for example, oxygen. Uh, it also helps to absorb shocks in the brain. Uh, and so if there was no fluid there and you did this with your head, uh, there would be no uh, mechanical way to absorb the bit of the shock from your brain moving back and forth inside your head. You also have the skull and the spine, which are the bones that provide physical protection from a mechanical injury. Um, your skull is quite hard. It's quite difficult uh, to make a hole in the skull. Uh, and so it is a good piece of protection, but your skull doesn't cover every single inch of your uh, central nervous system. If it did, you wouldn't have eyes or anything like that. So there are lots of gaps in the bone protection, um, which are ways in for physical damage, but the skull does provide a whole bunch of that. Now, when we dissect a brain, the skull, of course, will no longer be there. Uh, the cerebral spinal fluid will basically have been drained out because this brain is preserved. Uh, and the layers of protection between the skull and the brain are mostly removed. Sometimes there's one of the membranes left on the outside of the brain, uh, but most of the time when we dissect the brain, we don't get to see these parts because they've already been removed. Now, if we take a look at the brain, uh, we're going to start from the bottom up, okay? So we already saw what the spinal cord looks like. If we move up one step, we're going to look at the hindbrain. So if you want to position this on you, and you put your hand on the back of your neck here, and you feel where the base of your skull is. You'll feel the bone kind of ends there. Right in there, there's where your hindbrain is, okay? Your brain, or your hindbrain, is the back bottom part of your brain. There are three major parts that you need to know that are part of the hindbrain. 
They are the cerebellum, the medulla or medulla oblongata, and the pons. And you can see them at the bottom of the picture of the brain here. Sometimes this part of the brain is called the brain stem uh, because it literally is the stem. When you think about the stem of a flower or a plant, you got the stem and then stuff is on the top of it. That's how this piece looks. The cerebellum over here, the one that's colored yellow, uh, is the part of the brain that's in control of unconscious coordination of posture, reflexes, body movements, fine motor skills. For example, when you learned how to write when you were young, you were training your muscles so that your cerebellum could take over and do it unconsciously for you. Lots of you are writing right now, and I bet you, you are not consciously thinking, I need to make an A. What is the shape of an A? I need to draw a line. What is the shape of a line? And you might not remember this from when you were young, but when you were young, those kind of thoughts had to be going through your head because you had never written words before. Um, your brain wasn't trained to make the shapes of letters before. Now, other skills, for example, riding a bike. Uh, how many people can ride a bike in here? Usually that's something that most people can do. Uh, and how many of you fell off your bike at least once when you were learning how to ride it? Right? Because you hadn't trained your cerebellum yet to take over and understand which movements your arms and legs and body needed to make together so that you didn't fall over. Now, the other day, <laughs> I can skate. I can skate on ice well. Uh, but I haven't used rollerblades in quite some time, and the control that's required for rollerblades is significantly different than what you do when you're on ice. And I'm rollerblading with my daughter, who's like, wow, mom, you're so good at that. And I'm like, I know. And then I go to two foot stop, like I'm on a pair of hockey skates on the ice, and I biff all over the park. Uh, and she's like, oh no, mom, you're dead. No, it's because my brain is so trained for the movements of skating that because I wasn't concentrating on what I was doing, I did the wrong one. So my cerebellum failed me there. It receives information from receptors called proprioceptors. They detect the position of all of your muscles and joints. So close your eyes. Yeah, do it, close your eyes. Where are your hands? You know where your hands are because you can feel them. You're like, oh, my hands are, I hope, just like by your sides, not doing anything weird, maybe they were writing. But you have these proprioceptors that tell your brain, even without visual cues, where the parts of your body are so that you can be coordinated without thinking about it. Now, if I look, going from the bottom up, the medulla comes first, then the pons. The medulla doesn't stick out as much as the pons. The pons is the bumpier piece. The word pons comes from a word, and if you have ever learned French, you might have heard the word pont, and that's how we say it in French, it's a bridge. And so think of the pons, it look, see it looks like a bridge going over something. Uh, that's a way that you can remember which one is which. The medulla is lower, the pons is higher, the pons sticks out more. The medulla you probably heard about before because it's involved with involuntary automatic responses like your heart rate, like the contraction and dilation of blood vessels, like your rate of breathing. And so I'm guessing that at some point in Bio 20 that might have been mentioned somewhere along the line. Um, it's also involved with other things that happen automatically, like swallowing and coughing. So any sort of involuntary, automatic response, stuff that your body does without you having to control it, your medulla probably plays a role. Then you have the pons, so the one that sticks out more. It's above and in front of the medulla. It's a relay center, and you'll find that a lot of the structures we'll mention are relay centers. They're there to help connect other parts of the brain. We've seen already that the nervous system has the spinal cord, which extends out to the periphery. So the pons is part of the pathway that helps convey all of the information that's coming up through the spinal cord and from the medulla and the cerebellum to the other parts of the brain. It's also gonna connect the right and left hemispheres of the brain. So we'll see that in a couple of slides that your brain is actually two halves like you can see, oh, I almost dropped it. Like you can see here, two sides uh, that are pretty symmetrical in terms of the structures that they have there, but there are two sides. Now, the next section of the brain is the midbrain, which is in the middle. 
Uh, depending on which picture you look at, the midbrain has a different shape. So I don't like to distinguish or characterize what shape is the midbrain, but rather I like to say where it is. It's right above the pons. If you can find the pons, which you should be able to because it's a big bump that sticks out, the bit of tissue that's right above it is the midbrain. It relays especially visual and auditory information from the hindbrain uh, to the forebrain, which will be the top part. It's particularly involved with eye movement and skeletal muscle control. So connecting things and helping control things, getting information from the brain down to the spinal cord and back up. Now we move on to the forebrain. The forebrain is what you're thinking of when you think of the word brain. If I said, imagine what a brain looks like, you imagine the forebrain. This is what you imagine, because it's the top wrinkly looking part of the brain and some of the internal structures that are there. Now I'm gonna mention a select few structures, and I want you to be aware that there are lots more things in your brain, but I had to do a whole university degree to learn about all of them, uh, so we're just touching on a few of them here. So just be aware, more parts to the brain than this. One of them is the thalamus, which we heard Amy mention, right? You talked about thalamus? No, who talked about thalamus? Victoria talked about the thalamus uh, in their de facto today. Uh, the thalamus is a connector. It has neurons that connect different parts of the brain, um, especially the hind brain, so the brain stem, the medulla pons cerebellum, and the uh, sensory system. So. Sometimes it's called the great relay station, especially for senses, for touch, for smell, for taste, uh, for all of, or sorry, not for smell, for touch, for taste, for vision, for hearing. Um, great relay center, because it's helping relay information from sensory receptors to different parts of the brain, and then back out for motor output. The hypothalamus, is the structure that's directly below the thalamus. So typically when we represent the thalamus, it'll look sort of like a circle. And then the hypothalamus is like a weird trapezoid shape that's below and in front of it. When I'm trying to identify structures, I actually look at the pituitary gland first. The pituitary gland is something we'll talk about in the, in the chapter at the end of this unit on your endocrine system. The pituitary gland is easy to identify. It's this little dangling thing that sort of hangs off right here on the front part of the brain. If you can find the pituitary gland, the thing it's attached to is the hypothalamus. And the structure a bit higher than that, a bit further into the brain, is the thalamus. So I'm telling you where things are located relative to each other because, like I said, different artists draw slightly different shapes sometimes for these structures, and I don't want you to get hung up on a shape, I want you to think about position, where it is relative to the other structure. Now your hypothalamus, hypo means less than, so it's below the thalamus, that's what its name means. It's in charge of the regulation of your internal environment. So it helps control some of the same things that your medulla is doing. So blood pressure, heart rate, thirst, hunger, emotions. It's a link between your nervous and endocrine systems because it coordinates the actions of this pituitary gland, which is where quite a few uh, of the big hormones that we'll talk about are either produced or released from. And then the last part of your forebrain that we really need to focus on is the cerebrum. The cerebrum is four-fifths or 80% of the weight of the brain, so it's the biggest piece. It's the wrinkly piece that you imagined when you imagined a brain, uh, not all the other pieces that go along with it. Now, if you take a look, I've put two pictures here, one from the side and then one that's a slice through, so as if you we were looking from the front. Uh, but each half of the brain is made up, like we already saw, of an internal mass of white matter and a little thin external layer of gray matter. The gray matter is called the cerebral cortex. The cerebral cortex, that is the part of your brain that you think with. Anything that involves an advanced behavior, like using language, like having memory, like having a personality and conscious thought, like reasoning, all of those things are dealt with in the cerebral cortex. Now, earlier, Daryl, I think, asked, how come all neurons aren't myelinated? 
wouldn't it make sense for everything to be myelinated because <clears throat> nerve impulses travel faster? And so one of the reasons that we think that they aren't, right, because we don't know why things came to be, we just know that they came to be and we can deduce the reasons, but there seems to be a trade-off between flexibility in terms of making new connections, forming new pathways, and myelination. Neurons that have less myelination seem to have more flexibility, and neurons that have more myelination, although they transmit faster, seem to have less, less flexibility. So there's a bit of a trade-off between transmission speed and what we call plasticity, the ability to change connection, connections and change pathways. And since the cerebral cortex is involved with so many of those advanced behaviors, it kind of would make sense that we want that part to have plasticity and flexibility uh, as opposed to just super fast speed because we're dealing with all these really advanced things that require lots of input. It's about five millimeters thick. It has convolutions, so wrinkles, to increase its surface area. And hopefully you remember way back, science 10, you probably did a lab where you measured the surface area and volume of stuff and you discovered whew, when there's more surface and less volume, stuff works better. Uh, and so uh, the wrinkliness of brains uh, has often been investigated as the explanation for why some species seem smarter than others. There, there's lots of other stuff that goes into that too, but lots of surface area means we can have lots of cerebral cortex lots of connections for those advanced behaviors. Uh, now, there are two halves, and the two halves are connected by what's called the corpus callosum. So if you look at my picture, this little bit that's highlighted in orange, that's the corpus callosum. From the side, it kind of looks like a misshapen banana, and from the front, it looks like a V. It's a bundle of white matter that connects the two sides for the brain. You may have heard, because uh, usually there's at least one person who's heard about um, treatments for epilepsy that involve cutting connections in the brain, and there are treatments that have existed where cutting a part or some of the corpus callosum uh, were used to treat epilepsy, so epilepsy is a disorder where you have seizures, uh, and the thought is stopping the transmission of the extra electrical activity to both sides. Now, we are going to quickly run out of time today. So just before we do, I'll make mention that you have two sides of your brain. Each side seems to dominate particular types of function. And in our class on Monday, I'll show you the Stroop effect. It's kind of cool.